right, now we move on to a panel about a burning issue around AI to do with truth and trust in the age of AI. And the objective of this session is to focus on perhaps the emerging gap between two things. One, the opportunity from generative AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals through sophisticated and fast data and trend analysis, the stuff that it does really well. And on the other hand, the urgency to develop trustworthy AI systems and collectively commit to ethical AI practices. I am all ears and you should be too. I want to introduce a renowned global policy advisor, Alice Pillia, to moderate the session. Alice is an expert in public policy, corporate affairs, and sustainable business practices. She advises global companies on strategic approaches to the big geopolitical challenges, to also government and institutional relations. And her former roles as global head of policy and sustainability at Condé and the senior advisor at the UK cabinet office holder in very good stead for this session. Alice, over to you. Hi, and thank you so much. So good afternoon and welcome everybody. Um, before we start, I'd really like to thank Marcia Belishan and the team of Relax for involving me in such a brilliant event. As Shivi just mentioned, our session this afternoon will focus on the truth and trust gap in the age of AI and on how to address it. Uh, we heard uh, earlier today how Gen AI could really offer some new opportunities to advance uh, the SDGs, but we also heard about a lot of potential risks. So over the next 40 minutes or so, uh, we will explore how the positive impact of emerging technology can only be harnessed if we develop trustworthy AI, and if we collectively commit to a system of algo ethics that ensures AI operates within boundaries and that promotes justice and fairness. It's a really fascinating topic and we'll do our best to leave some time for questions at the end. So please do submit your questions and comments using the chat function. But let me introduce our speakers for this afternoon so that we can get started. So joining me uh, today are Nancy Morgan, CEO of Ellis Morgan Enterprises and strategic advisor of the Cantellus Group. Nancy is, national, is a national security leader and uh, she's uh, the former chief data officer for the US government intelligence community. She has an incredibly extensive experience in leading strategy and innovation and in driving transformation in the data and information technology arenas in both government and the private sector. Our second panelist is uh, Karen Silverman. Karen is the CEO and founder of the Cantellus Group. Uh, she's a leading global expert in practical governance strategies for AI and other frontier technologies. She advises companies in the public sector um, and in the private sector, of course, on how to manage cutting edge technologies. And uh, Karen has a legal background. Uh, so she previously advised uh, businesses on antitrust matters, m &A, uh, and crisis management. She's also a author and a speaker on uh, technology and uh, corporate governance issues. Welcome, uh, Karen and Nancy. So the first question is for Karen. Karen, according to the Edelman Trust Barometer, trust in media and government is at a record low. Um, I think that a couple of years ago, a Europol report claimed that by 2026, over 90% of all online content will be synthetic. Is generative AI contributing to building a post-truth society and should be tech do more to prevent this? Yeah, I think these are all really big questions. And thank you for having me. And thank you to, to Marcia and, and Relics for in putting this together. Um, I think that's a really important question as you as you pose it. I think that you know the Edelman Trust Index is something that we've looked at over decades now. And so we can really see big trends emerging from that data. And I think it's it's identification of generative AI and synthetic data and um, sort of a lack of standards, quite frankly, um, around what we're going to you know, declare to be authentic versus inauthentic um, is, is a real uh, 
issue point and one that we're going to have to get a lot smarter about. And I think the first thing we have to get a lot smarter about before we start making assignments to to corporates and and to to organizations and to to individuals is what we're going to what we're going to hold out as a standard for authentic. Like what is real? What is you know and 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 what are the categories in which we're going to care most about that and and then also things like labeling which we can talk about a little bit later but but i think really doing some deep thinking about what we care about and in what context and then as we are doing that deep thinking um making sure that the organizations that are both generating you know creating the tools that 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 support the generation of this content but also that are publishing it that are um, asking us to think about how we're consuming it clearly responsibilities there as well as responsibilities on the on those of us who are consuming it and i think it's that it's that um that relationship between the generators of the information through the, the the creators the platforms and the consumers of the information that all has to be slightly re-engineered right because the the things that we used to know and to trust if we knew it when we saw it aren't going to be as good um navigational instruments as we're used to. And I, I, there's a lot more to unpack there, but I think these are real issues. I don't think they're going away. I think they are, as as Europol has indicated, going to proliferate. Um, they're gonna proliferate in lots of different categories for lots of different reasons. And and we're better off thinking very carefully about the diversity of those use cases, as opposed to trying to lump it all into one, um, one policy or one approach or one, um, one set of abilities, if that makes sense. Thank you, Karen. Nancy, um, it looks like uh, trust in AI and its reliability is another very critical issue. Even the most advanced LLMs are not free from bias, and that could really lead to increased uh, discrimination or unfairness uh, in their applications. Uh, we've been we've been reading um, uh, some some news about AI developers that might be prioritizing shiny products over safety, which I personally find quite alarming. Um, so there is no doubt that the tech is becoming very complex and and difficult to grasp for the vast majority of people. But do you think that enhanced transparency and explainability of AI systems? Uh, are important factors in terms of building public trust. Alice, thank you for inviting me to join this important conversation and Marcia, Marcia and the Relix team too. Um, I have to start with a disclaimer as a former US government official, the views expressed are my own and do not imply endorsement by any particular US government agency. But now that we've got that out of the way, I really think transparency and explainability in AI are essential for building public trust and demonstrating accountability across both the public and private sectors. I will share a recent quote from the U.S. Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines. It was her opening statement to the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence on the 15th of May, where she said, innovations in AI have enabled foreign influence actors to produce seemingly authentic and tailored messaging more efficiently, at greater scale, and with content adapted for different languages and cultures. In fact, we have already seen generative AI being used in the context of foreign elections. So this is just one optic, but a really critical one on the environments that I've spent the most time in my career in of just how pervasive this is, both the promise and some of the perils that I think we're talking about a little bit today related to misinformation. People and organizations need to understand what the AI system or capability that they're developing or planning to use, what it's supposed to do, what information is being collected, how it's being used, are they generating more information, and how that information will be safeguarded. If it's a more complex system, we have to go deeper and understand the components not only individually, but how they work together when you build composite capabilities. And I think that's an area that's gonna need more attention as we get more mature in how we use AI. And it goes deeper in that. I can't help but as a former chief data officer, organizations need to understand what are the data sources being used to train the models. Ensure that we have sufficient diversity in teams developing the capabilities and appropriate diversity in the data sets a sufficient quantity of data to train the models and to keep updating those models. And that's something that I think is becoming a challenge for certain organizations right now. 
we're going to have to conduct more formalized testing and evaluation. And then we have to be able to interrogate the results, something Karen and I like to talk about, and making sure people have the skills to interrogate those results. It's not just once and done, it's an ongoing responsibility. It's a responsibility for developers, deployers, and users of systems, consumers of data. Candidly, it's a whole of society responsibility that we all have to engage in. And that's why I think events like today are so important to increase the public discourse on these topics. Do you think, do you think that uh, AI developers are doing a good job at trying to explain how their system works at the moment? Could they do better? <laughs> I think it depends, and I think and I think they could do better. And look, I am married to a former developer, and my son is a software developer, so you know I'm swimming in it on all sides. As well as I have led, you know, large scale development teams in in government in, in past lives. I think it depends. I think when there is time pressure, I don't know that they're spending as much time thinking about how to explain what it does and how to document what it does. But it's interesting. This is an area where I think AI might be able to help. I think we're seeing signs of it in the software development community of how can AI tools help generate the documentation. That's a cumbersome thing. Developers want to go develop the next shiny new thing, as you said, but this is an area where the technology may be able to help. The technology can also help go back and look at existing systems and dig into how the code works and help for some of the modernization that is needed. Um, I like to say systems shouldn't be old enough to go to college or become middle-aged. And in government circles, we have some systems that are definitely old enough to be middle-aged. That's not healthy. Um, and we'll talk about some health aspects of AI as this conversation continues. So I think that is an ongoing responsibility, not just to go for speed of getting a capability out there, but to do it right and do it in a responsible and trustworthy way. And so that documentation and explainability. Yeah, and I want, I want to put a plug in. I don't know if this is in defense of engineers or not, but I think very often the problem starts even before we get to the engineers. I mean, it, 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 they, there's, an equal, there's an equal responsibility on business teams or operations teams to, to, um, to articulate well what they want from the tools. And I think we're also, we could, this is another area where we could do a lot better, is, is making sure that, the, that the, those who are commissioning these tools or who intend to use these tools have a much better vocabulary, much more sophisticated understanding of what's possible and a, and a way to um, express and be in conversation with engineers around uh, about what they want to get out of the tools, how the context in which they're really going to be used and how they're really going to be governed once they are being used. And I think we, we still tend to design our workflows to, to um, separate those two communities. And I think more and more, we're going to start seeing those two communities operating in tandem in, in um, much more robust workflows. But that's mostly a future state at this point, as opposed to a, an existing state. Is that fair, Nancy? Absolutely fair. And frankly, I think the most successful programs you have, the mission or business stakeholders and the IT people, I like to say shoulder to shoulder. In the virtual age, it might be virtual shoulder to shoulder, but really co-creating, co-designing and co-managing once things are in the wild or in production, you know, not just in the development state, but when they're actually in use. You can really see how different players are affected by a capability. Thank you. You, you both touched on a few really important uh, issues, I believe. The first one, obviously, is the importance of creating really robust principles uh, for creating and developing quality content. Uh, then you both touched on the importance of transparency and clear information, um, which are both critical, of course. What else do you think can be done to empower audiences? I'll jump in here. So one thing I think is we're suffering, and you know I certainly see this every day, I feel like I can't keep up with the content coming at me. We're suffering from information overload and knowledge malnutrition. It's not a new statement. It actually dates back to the early 2000s, but it is catchy. And I have three thoughts here. So first, we need to invest in digital and AI literacy and acumen. And frankly, for this audience, I would add to that data and media literacy and some basic cyber hygiene awareness. It's all of these dimensions at every level of our organization, from the new employees all the way up to leadership in the boardroom. It also starts in education. We're going to have to start educating our young people at much earlier ages and then growing into more age-appropriate 
content and training at the different ages and stages, both in their education and then in their professional careers. We need to focus on how to identify, create, and seek out information quality, how to separate fact from fiction. In the case of misinformation, how to identify authentic content and how to understand sort of accident from intent to cause harm. Right now, I think we talked about this earlier this week, we are bombarded by highly accessible yet poor quality content. And in some cases, the high quality content is barricaded behind a paywall. And I understand why we do that, but is this perpetuating inequality and inequity? And I think that's something as part of the sustainable development goals, that's an example of an area that needs further, further research and discussion. In the case of public sector organizations, it's important to build trust in institutions. And in the case of this corporate world, I would extend it to the brand and the reputation. And are we causing harm because we're not taking care of the information that's being made available to the communities? Yeah. And, and to that, I would just add that I think that this focus on critical thinking and the ability to um, sort of inspect and interrogate, like, what does good look like, you know, is, is a really important question that that need, that is actually very well aligned with corporate purpose most often, right? That this that that the workforce's ability to do that, leadership's ability to do that, regulators' ability to do that, all align with more productivity and and better better, more sustainable, more robust and resilient results. And so, you know, we, we might have to. Um, we might have to go slow to go fast in, for, for, you know, in, in new and different ways. And so in addition to principles, I think we really have to focus on um, sort of the related concept of incentives, right? Which what, what kinds of systems are we building to incentivize what kinds of behaviors? And if all the incentives, like Nancy said, are to, you know, spit code out quickly or get products to market as soon as the proof of concept is, is you know, you know, secured um, without the usual kind of testing and, and kind of governance we would put around any other sort of product, we're, we're going to get those sorts of results unless we kind of re-engineer not just the products, but our systems into which we're placing those products. And that includes our organizations. So, and it includes the ways we think on it at a, at a very fundamental level. And there's two more things I'd add. The lexicon, the common terminology, to foster improved communication and understanding. We've all got to keep working on this. Even frankly, the terms misinformation, disinformation, and trust are not always as well understood as they could be and from different roles and dimensions. So I think that is important time within organizations to get your terminology as part of that literacy campaign, or I like to call it acumen. I didn't like, our workforce didn't like being called illiterate, which they weren't, but you know, focusing on growing their acumen and fluency. I think the other area that comes up in this space can't help ourselves to talk about watermarking and content authentication. However, I think those technologies are still relatively immature. Um, I think it involves, you know, the watermarking involves embedding markers into multimedia content so it can be accurately identify, identified as AI or machine generated. Um, there's watermark embedding and watermark detection algorithm work to be done. It's good in theory, but a little bit problematic at present. Um, I think there are also the standards are not necessarily fully adopted yet. So technology be created by one organization might not be readable or visible to other systems. So that's a problem. The inefficient and inconsistent detection results to date are highly problematic. And then the cybersecurity issues. I can't help myself coming from my background that some watermarks have been tampered with. So I think there is good work going on. Organizations like C2PA, the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authority, um, a mix of organizations getting involved with that for verifying authenticity, promoting provenance of data. I'm a big fan of that as a, as a chief data officer type and you know, invisible metadata that's embedded in the digital content to identify the creator and verify the content authenticity, the cryptographic binding, but Developers have to implement the whole specification if they do it and do it properly. And I think that's where this rush to market might not be getting done as thoroughly as it could. So it's been kind of a big month in May, both LinkedIn, the BBC and Fujifilm all made announcements about their research and progress to date. And all of them, it's a good start, but what I would call necessary, but not sufficient and not quite enough yet. So some of the LinkedIn usage is already, there are already problems found with it. BBC has done some really interesting research on how Providence builds trust. So I think that's great. 
um, what kind of information people to ex expect to see with these markings, but it's a lot of it. Uh, but it does show that people trust media more if there are these kind of markings and trust in the different types of content, like user-generated content and so on. So we've got more combined work to do in this space. And those strong public-private sector partnerships are going to be really critical for this. So that's just an ongoing area that needs some is, attention. Is there a risk of a proliferation of different uh, types of watermark systems? Yes. Labeling <laughs> that might just confuse people even more. Uh, putting back my sustainability hat, I know that that's a very big issue, for yes. example, in relation to uh, you know, sustainability um, uh, accreditations and so on. Yeah, I think I think the credibility and um, coherence of the marks is something that's going to be very important. A and again, it's it's there isn't an easy button here, right? We're going to actually require people to to understand which marks matter when, right? Like so, so if something has been altered, that that may or may not matter right. depending on the purpose for which I'm using it. And so, the, so if we want somebody to um, be more informed as a citizen. That sort of that's one cascade of implications from these marks. If I want, a, you know, somebody on my workforce not to send out wire transfers without, like, triple checking, <laughs> that's a different kind of context and cascade. So I think, along with the kinds of um, indicators and along with these technology solutions, we're also going to need behavior change. Yeah. And that's 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 where so when we talk about this in organizations, we talk about the responsible use of trustworthy technology, right? And the responsible use is sort of what the what the humans do with it and, and what what we believe and want to do and what our objectives are and where it goes and how our our requests are aligned with objectives and things like that. Trustworthy technology is just also is, is sort of the solid state part of it, right? It's it's making sure that the products do what they say they're going to do. And they are, um, I know we've had conversations in other contexts about the difference between faith and trust, but but that it's a really important distinction here, right? It's that trust is earned. It's it, it's something that we achieve when we've done a lot of testing and vigilance and validation. Um, it's it's not something that that can be demanded. And I think the we, we're using the word a little bit too freely in con, in the context of these technologies at this particular moment in time. And so, so developing technologies we trust, developing processes we trust, you know, and, and then behaviors that we trust are all happening at the same time. And that's super confusing. And so I think will labels be helpful in kind of corralling some of this work? Yes, but it's going to still require a lot of um, human engagement. So that that yeah. seems to reconnect to the um, point of uh, education. Uh, yeah. Very quickly, is there any um, initiative that you think is working in terms of improving education on this matter uh, at a wide public level uh, and in terms of fostering uh, digital media literacy? Although I know that you don't like the concept, uh, the term of uh, media literacy. Well, I like acumen or fluency more than literacy because I like what it implies of people mm -hmm. becoming even more capable. And I think in the ongoing responsibility and doing this throughout a life cycle of things, I don't think I've seen a single, you know, single organization or single program yet. I think there are programs evolving. And I think organizations making time available for their workforce to invest in this upskilling and invest in this foundational skilling, we're going to have to build it into the education systems. And as I said at earlier levels, I think we all talked about, well, we'll do this with college students. Then we said high school students, frankly, to use a U.S. term, back to middle school students or, you know, earlier in education, these responsibilities. So I think this is an ongoing area and, again, a public-private part you know, partnership opportunity to figure out what kinds of content we need and how do we make that content accessible to everyone who needs it, not just a certain set of people. And, I, and I'm concerned about that, about how we make this kind of foundational training available. Um, AI okay. tools could help with that, but you have to have the foundational technology and infrastructure if we're gonna do it that way for people to be able to access the content and experiment with the content. Thank you. Karen, can you think of uh, anybody that got it right so far? I don't think this is something you get right, honestly. <laughs> I'm gonna be a little controversial. I think this is something, I, I, it, you know, Nancy alluded to it. This is a journey, not a destination. I think there are people who are right. 
more meaningfully committed to the journey and, and showing progress. Um, but I don't think it's something we, and it's not something we just achieve and then can go on and do the next thing. Um, and that's in part because the technology is changing, but it's also because so. of just so the general application of these technologies is so vast that that we're going to you know, the bad guys are going to be getting better at being bad guys and the good guys are going to get better at being good guys and everything in between. Um, and your five year olds today are going to be 10 year olds tomorrow and the technology that they're going to experience just in that natural progress is going to require us to keep thinking about new ways to, um, you know, yeah. new ways to approach this whole category of governance and, and responsibility and ethics and compliance and all of that whole suite. So I think, I think this is ongoing work. Um, I, I think many of the education, educational institutions are now this year sort of taking this very seriously in terms of trying to figure out not just how to use the tools, but how to um, sort of what's, what are their what are their teaching objectives, right? What what are we trying to get communicated? Right. What are the citizens we're trying to inform? Um, I think there's a lot of focus right now because of the election season that we are in to sort of inform the population very generally to be cautious. But we have not backed that up with either good tools or really good explanations for why. Um, I think within commercial organizations and even within some public sector organizations, we are completely ignoring the risks of disinformation just in the day-to-day -day commercial life of an organization and, and how it's going to gum up the works and, and really is a threat to both productivity and mental health and probably fiscal health. So we so we need so we're, we're really lagging on those categories that aren't as glamorous. We're, st we're still chasing the glamorous bits and not chasing the less glamorous bits, which are probably in the end going to be more important. And I think I would just add the international cooperation is going to be key here in the collaboration. These are global issues. These do not stay neatly within the borders of one country or the borders of one company or organization. And I think we should leverage the best of ideas here and try and help raise all boats, as we like to say, in terms of doing this. But that's going to take, you know, ongoing work. It's going to take the full scope of the public and private sector to work together to be able to do this effectively. Yeah, and and Nancy, it's really going to take. I think it, it's like, like you said, these tools can can help us narrow the digital divide, or they will exacerbate it. And right. that's a choice that we are going to be making, right? This is this is a very affirmative moment where we get to sort of start to decide what kind of future we want with these tools, both social and technical. And, and, and I think if we let nature take its course or let other people decide for right. us, we're gonna get what we get, right? So, right. so my, my, my call to action very often is that everybody needs to engage with this set of issues for themselves, for their families at a minimum, right? And start thinking about, well, what, what do I want? Right. What, what do I care about? What do I what do I want these tools to do with me, for me, around me? What do I not want them to do with me, for me, around me? And, but from an informed position, not from a reactive position. And I don't know that we are in the main prepared to have that conversation just yet. But that's that would be a really good advance. On, a, on, on this note, um, Nancy, you're touching on uh, the incentive for developers, which basically speed. Uh, and we heard in the previous session how policymakers are basically struggling to keep pace with technological development. Uh, you also just mentioned the fact that it's really important to have shared ethical principles to improve collaborations, not just between public and private sector, but also across borders, to be frank, at the global level. Um, last uh, weekend, the G7 leaders committed to a number of actions to hopefully improve shared ethical standards, uh, improve collaborations, and uh, basically create uh, some sort of, uh, you know, common governance uh, approach. What framework do you think is necessary to promote a more ethical use of AI? And um, how can uh, international cooperation be fostered to create more cohesive approaches uh, of governance? So I think that's part of it. And I think Karen will jump in on it too. I think this is where having these international bodies and these organizations, having the conversations, inviting 
participants, even when we don't all agree, that is healthy for figuring out what's the art of the possible here and what's driving in these different frameworks um, and, and how to do this. So I think this international cooperation is ongoing, building on the G7, the OECD, the UN, I could keep going and listing organizations. The safety summits, the collaboration between the safety institutes or in growing the, those partnerships. The having more voices at the table as we scope out the possibilities and what the standard should be and thinking about the downstream impacts, we need more voices, not just developers, but who is impacted by these capabilities. So are we creating that opportunity and that space to do it? So I don't know that I can think of one single one right now versus building on, but I liked a lot of the foundational principles that came out of the G7 discussions, building on the Hiroshima Accords, like where these are going. You have the EU AI Act, you have the White House AI, you know, executive order on AI and keep going. Um, and you have other countries working on the same. But I think it is important to invite other countries who are not completely aligned with our thinking into mm -hmm. the conversation. That is critical to keep the dialogue open and try and get to yes where we can, even if those are hard fought conversations. That's something we've done on the international stage in diplomacy and intelligence and defense for my entire career. Karen, you may have some added thoughts. Um, I, no, I, I just think that at, at a substantive level, when you look at all of the sets of, of principles, including the ones coming out of the G7, um, they share a lot of commonality at a high level, right? And we've, we've been staying at kind of a high level for a long time, you know, fairness, equity, transparency, accountability, you know, sort of big, big words, big principles. I think the hard work right now is how are we going to make those words mean um important things within an organization and or within a group of organizations and and international you know staying as um aligned and if not aligned at least in conversation around the world on some of these key principles i think is going to be really critical and i am encouraged by seeing how much activity you know and energy is going into that that set of exercises and particularly not just on the um not, not just on the geopolitical threat side of things, but but also just on the you know the human rights side of things and on the you know impact on climate side of things. So all of these, I, I think the conversation has, in the in the scheme of things, we've 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 actually accelerated conversations that have otherwise taken decades in other categories, right up to the front of the line with respect to AI, how it you know, how it needs to be at the center of the international conversation and the diplomatic conversation and the national security conversation um, in a way that we, you know, it took us decades to do and other, like even cybersecurity took longer than it should have, you know, to get to get where AI already is. So that I'm not as worried that we're not doing it perfectly as I am encouraged that we're doing it at all as quickly as we've been doing it. Karen, at the G7, Pope Francis ended up being the um, main champion <laughs> of uh, algorithmics, uh, and uh, you know he was the first pope to ever address uh, the, the to, to ever in fact attend the a G7 summit, and he really focused his speech on uh, the importance of building a framework that can champion and achieve global equity and bridge the digital divide. You you touched on those concepts a couple of times. And uh, that seems very relevant and aligned with SDG 16. And it's all about peace, justice, and strong institutions. Do you think that we can truly ensure all nations benefit from AI advancements when AI is becoming such a big geopolitical issue? I don't think we can ensure it. I think we have to do the work, right? I mean, I think that that's the real answer is that we have to, we have to keep it in mind. And I think that's in a way how I interpreted a lot of what he was saying is that that has to be one of our core, like our one of our, can you have more than one North Star? I don't know, but it, <laughs> if it is among our North Stars, if we were to have several, I, I, I mean, I think it's 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 really critical to, to have that always in mind as a goal, um, you know, and as in all things, you know, we're gonna be, balance and this is again i guess where i come back to incentives we, we can't just talk about that as a goal we have to start aligning our incentives towards that goal and so i think that's the work that's part of the work we have to do right 
is, is, is taking those concepts, planting them in our view, and then starting to align how we're how we're motivating each other and ourselves to do those things, which which we've not been great at, candidly, in some other areas. Great. Um, I think that we are almost out of time. I have a uh, final question for you both. Um, so we really often focus on the dystopian scenarios related to uh, Gen AI and to other frontier technology. But I'd love to close this session on a much more positive note. So can I ask both of you to, to share if there is uh, anything about Gen AI that makes you optimistic? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the, I, I, I think, and, and this is not a unique example, but like, you know, the, the speed with which we got to a, a COVID vaccine, right? I mean, that, 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 we can, we, that we can use AI and related technologies to accelerate human understanding for, for the benefit of the planet is it, like, that is the, the positive future and how, and, and how we can um, distri you know, distribute the, the benefits of education and opportunity more equitably, I think is one of the you know, sort of obvious possibilities. I just think that we're not gonna inevitably get those if we don't also then do the work. And the other thing that I take hope in therefore is like, what is it gonna take to get to that work? And it's like, we're gonna take a little bit more time. Like we, we're gonna have to manage ourselves and our organizations <laughs> and you know, as people, and we know how to do that. Right, we're just not we're just sort of not yet doing it that way, and we need to take a little more time to think about the things that matter to us, to design our organizations to align with what our our goals are, and and to take care of each other as we adapt to these technologies. And we know how to do all of that stuff. So I, I actually don't think we're as um, I don't think we're as outmatched as I think a lot of the popular press would have us believe in some ways. I, th I think there's still a lot more resource that we have that is uniquely human that we haven't quite brought to the table yet. And Alice, you know, building on Karen's comment, I, I am optimistic about how a AI can augment human machine teaming, reducing cumbersome tasks. I'd certainly have some on my list. I would be delighted to let the machines take over and care for me, free up more time for humans to do those higher order tasks that are well suited for humans. Um, new ways to deliver content with quality built in, as we've been talking about, new methods and ways to deliver training and perhaps new reach of how we can get training available to people. I think immersive technology has got some really interesting possibilities. Accelerating innovation in areas like public health, that's a passionate one for me. I have a family member with a very rare disease and already, I wouldn't say gen AI, but other parts of AI handling the volume of data, looking at other disease families is leading to new helpful treatments for a very rare disease that doesn't get funding. So those are the kinds of things where I think that's the power and potential that we wanna level and that we wanna take advantage of. And then I think inspiring wholly new creative outputs with multimodal capabilities. We've got some work to do. There are some things being generated that are a little bit odd right now, but as we work through that freeing up time and letting people have ways to do more creative things and to enable them, that's really exciting how quickly some of our younger generations and frankly, people at all age ranges adapt to the new technologies. So I can't think, we can't fully anticipate what we'll dream up. I just think it's back to that conversation of doing it in trustworthy and responsible and ethical ways and doing it together, taking the time to do it right. But I am excited about the promise. I'm not on the yeah. dystopian I, I extreme. That's if, you wanna, if, you wanna, if you wanna get really excited about AI, go listen to a bunch of like 11 year olds talk about it. <laughs> right. Because they know they because they're not constrained by the you know it'll make me do my paperwork faster kind of benefits. They're looking at actually like wow this is like a cool set of capabilities in my little hands yeah. right. So it's like the, they are inspiring. If you so if, yeah, when you feel start if despairing, go talk to the eleven year olds. <laughs> they, they've got to figure it out. We might have time for one uh question so there is one that i think is quite interesting from uh, uh anwar abbas um 
And uh, the question is uh, whether there are any thoughts about embedding symbols or text in all AI uh, generative content, so images, videos, all sorts of uh, uh, outputs, really, so that the recipient is aware of the source uh, used to um, the sources used to create the content, um, especially in a social media environment. Um, what uh, do you think, Karen and Nancy? We only have four minutes, so. <laughs> so I think I think it's building on that conversation. The work that C2PA has underway, they have introduced an icon of transparency and the concept of a digital nutrition label, perhaps to combat the knowledge of malnutrition that I mentioned earlier. It's not seen widespread adoption, it's early days, but I think those kinds of capabilities and conversations if we can figure out how to ensure that they're not tampered with. So that's the, the other side of me coming from my background. We've got some work to do, but I think the collaborate the collaborative efforts going on to try and figure that out are important. And then yeah. and the platforms the data, to require it, you know, when people are yeah. generating and creating content. Yeah, and the Data and Trust Alliance has good work on provenance right. that is another yep. sort of the companion piece to that. So there's, there's work out there, but at early days. Right. Where are there some experiments in using like blockchain technology to embed that sort of information into content? Right, that's part of it and sort of just working through, but you've got to work through the whole stack. So yeah. this can't just be done in this little piece of it. We're going to have to think about it in terms of the life cycle of information, how, con as Karen said, how content is generated, how it's used, how it's disseminated. Mm -hmm. If new content is combined and created, if people modify something, you know, think about a photographer, their original image, and then how it's, edited and updated over time. So that opens up all sorts of other questions about copyright, but that yeah. could not it it does. need a, yeah. a different session. Think about it in the context of if you you know your kid takes a picture on Snapchat and there's a filter on it. And then that picture then gets back into the data set, you know, the most identifying that as a picture with a filter on it is only useful for certain purposes. It's unuseful for training and it actually without a lot of um, engineering would tend to degrade the original data right. set. So there's all sorts of complexity around inserting and embedding tokens and things. So it, it's it's a complicated math problem. Let's leave it at that. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Karen. It has been such an immense pleasure uh, to join this session and uh, get to know you both to prepare it. And thank you again for Alexa for organizing this brilliant event and for having us today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.